I beat the Teal Mask only using new Pokemon. Here's how it went down. Back at school, we're introduced to Miss Briar, a professor from Blueberry Academy in the Unova region. Our schools have a yearly joint trip, and this year she'll be our chaperone as we head off to the land of Kitakami. She tells us that the author of the Violet book, the man who first discovered Paradox Pokemon Heath, was actually an ancestor of hers. Briar then reveals that she holds the original manuscript, having additional pages that the published version of the book omitted. Here we see a large turtle-like Pokemon with a crown on its back, which we all know to be Terrapagos. The professor's goal is to validate these pages, and I have a feeling that something in Kitakami just might help her out. After being joined by three nameless NPCs, gang gang. we finally arrive in the land of rice patties. As we approach the community center where we'll be staying, we're met by two students from Blueberry Academy, the brother and sister duo Kieran and Carmine. I see how the family dynamic goes here. I didn't know what levels would look like in the DLC, so I packed a team of pretty weak Pokemon along with my Skeledurge. After seeing a level 60 Poochiana, I decided I would intentionally lose this battle, then redo it once I leveled my new team up. Unfortunately, after being defeated, the story just continued, so we're 0-1 on the scoreboard against Carmine. Just as the Dami Mommy was about to make us one of her grunts, this man, who the devs didn't even care enough about to give a real name to, comes out and the pair runs off. He's called the Caretaker, and you guessed it, he'll be taking care of us guests. And just like that, we're free to explore. Now, there aren't too many new Pokemon in the Teal Mask, so before we can fill up a team, my plan is to use alternate forms of the Pokemon we can catch. First things first, in the Mossfell Confluence, I grab myself a Syrupy Apple, which we'll need shortly. Then I travel to Apple Hills, where I can catch three pretty high-leveled Applin who'll be joining the team. I try to heal my Fruity Worms, but accidentally trigger this cutscene. Thanks for nothing, chicken boy. Anyway, I can now evolve Pancake, Waffle, and French Tea into their final forms for this run. Which Apple Dragon is your favorite? Like for Flapple, comment for Appleton, and subscribe for Diplin. The next morning, we learn the purpose of this school trip, orienteering. So the whole reason for traveling to Kitakami is to take pictures with three signboards scattered around the area? Sure. Before splitting off into pairs, it's time for a battle with the other Kitakami native, Kirin. The boys' team consists of a Sentret and a Yanma, the latter of which is currently super effective against our three Pokemon. We still manage to take them both out, much to Chicken Boy's delight. Carmine then decides we'll be paired with her little bro, and we set off for the first signboard at Loyalty Plaza. I take the scenic route, catching myself a Polchageist along the way who I name Mochi. Yes, I know Mochi and Macha are different things. No further questions. We read the story of a fearsome ogre and three Pokemon, Okie Doggy, Monkey Dory, and Pheasantipity, who gave their lives to stop the rampaging beast when it threatened town. The trio were then crowned the Loyal Three for their dedication to the village and buried here at Loyalty Plaza. Kieran then interestingly says that he thinks the ogre is cool being able to hold its own against three other Pokemon all by itself. He tells us that he's climbed Oni Mountain numerous times hoping to meet the monster, but it never happened. After snapping this fun little flick, Kieran tells us the next signboard is at Kitakami Hall. This one gives us more information about the ogre, detailing that the power of its signature weapon, a cudgel, changes based on the mask it wears. The Loyal Three were able to wrestle away three of its four masks before falling, which greatly weakened the monster. Kieran opens up a bit more, telling us that he wants to get strong enough to do things for himself. That's why he admires the ogre. He then challenges us to another battle in front of the beast's supposed home, the dreaded den. His Sentret has evolved into a Furret, and he added a Poliwhirl to his team, but we still don't have much trouble taking him down. As we step inside to check the den out, we see a mysterious figure run off. We go back to Kieran's grandparents' house, and I guess the kid has never had a friend before. His grandma drips us out in this sweet jean bay and top knot, so we're all ready to go to the Festival of Masks. But first, I add Toast the Ursa Ring to the team as a placeholder for something special to come. I also have a Sinisty, but the only way to get a cracked or chipped pot in this game is to get lucky and have it show up at the Porto Marinata auction, so it's unlikely we'll evolve this Galarian ghost. We then meet the traveling photographer Perrin, who holds a striking resemblance to the ancient Adam Man. She even has a Hisuian Growlithe as her partner. She says that after we catch 150 Pokemon in the Kitakami Pokedex to talk to her again. 
well, that shouldn't be too hard. There's a decent amount of carryover from the Paldean deck, so I'm already at... Oh boy. While doing some exploring, I grab the Masterpiece and Unremarkable Teacups, using the latter to evolve Mochi into Sinistra. Take that, Perrin, number 11 on the board. Before heading over to Kitakami Hall for the festival, Carmine wants to see if she can take us down again. I'm sure you've realized by now that battling these two will be a common theme, so I'll just show the last fights against them which are the toughest. But wow is this girl fiery. Anyway, at night it's time to celebrate and the mysterious figure from the ogre's den has come to look on at the festival. We eventually notice them and follow what we believe to be a child that we go to talk to. Just then Carmine comes up behind us and scares them off. They lose their mask doing some parkour, and while we can see that this is clearly Ogre Pond, I guess Carmi needs to get her eyes checked. She stops us from telling Kieran about the Ogre, instead letting him think that we were making fun of him behind his back. You seriously couldn't think of anything better to say? We do see that she's just trying to protect her brother's feelings and possibly keep him out of danger, but why couldn't we just blame Chicken Boy? The next morning, we're back at the grandparents' house, and I hope nobody ever has to feel like Kieran here. Your boy comes over just to hang with your sister? Ouch. After showing the mask to their grandfather, he says that the truth of Kitakami's history is actually the opposite as what's written on the signboards. Apparently Ogre Pond and a human man came from a distant land to Kitakami long ago. In a classic case of xenophobia, the villagers were afraid of the two who looked nothing like them. They were banished to the mountains in isolation, but the village mask maker created four false faces for the two so that they could disguise themselves and mingle with the citizens. Each mask was also fitted with gemstones, much like those found in Area Zero that the man brought with him on his journey. Rumors of these shiny masks attracted a group of greedy Pokemon, those that would come to be known as the Loyal Three, to plan a heist. The man was the only one at the den when they attacked, managing to keep one mask safe, but by the time Ogre Pond returned, he was gone. The Pokemon then went down to the village and defeated the three evildoers, but from the perspective of the people, they simply saw a rampaging ogre. Carmine's grandpa then tells her that they're descendants of the mask maker who was branded a heretic for trying to tell the true story of Ogre Pond and the Loyal Three. It turns out Kieran was listening in on the whole thing, and then when he asks us about it, we lie right to his face. The last signboard talks about how people used to carry masks with them at night in case they ran into the ogre. If they hid their face, they'd be spared, but if not, they would lose their souls. We wrap the day up, and then the next morning, Carmine tells us that we need to get a crystal cluster from the crystal pool in order to repair Ogre Pond's mask. As we arrive, we're ambushed by a Milotic, but it easily falls to Carmine's Morpico and our Diplin. It left a crystal cluster behind, but before we can head back to the village, we see Briar at the mountaintop. She tells us that the water here emits the same wavelength as terrestrial energy, and it seems her goal is to study it and replicate the terrestrialization phenomenon in other regions. Okay, I know what you're all thinking. Don't. Say it. We go to hand the Crystal Cluster over, but the duo's grandfather says that Kieran stole the mask and went to Loyalty Plaza. Oh boy, the kid has finally snapped. Now he's in his villain arc. Couple his rage with the fact that he's finally evolved his Yanma into Yan Mega, and this fight just got a whole lot tougher. We barely get through this one alive, and something tells me this Gligar isn't too far from becoming a Gliscor. He returns the mask, but then the ground starts shaking, and to our surprise, the Loyal Three are revived. They immediately get back up to their old schemes, having the caretaker hand over the three masks that were kept at Kitakami Hall. We find them beating up on the maskless Ogre Pond, and Monkey Dory steps up to battle us. Ursa Ring chips away at the monkey with a slash before going down, but thankfully Mochi can come in, survive a sludge wave, and finish it off with Shadow Ball. The three then run off, and we decide to help Ogre Pond get its other masks back. She comes along with us, but can't be used in battle just yet. The first stop is Wisteria Pond to battle Monkey Dory again, but somehow it's been powered up just like the Titan Pokemon of Paldea. Its Sludge Wave does massive damage with a crit on Toast, but Carmine's Morpico is actually going to come up huge with Thunder Wave, especially after seeing how little damage we do to this thing. Aura Wheel hits hard too, so I'd give the Kitakami and Girl an A plus as a partner so far. Eventually, Hermitiana gets the finishing blow with a crunch, and just like that, we've retrieved the Wellspring Mask. For my next target, I set my sights on Pheasant Dippity at Oni Mountain. 
The bird then flees, forcing us on a wild goose chase. See what I did there? Oh, brother, this guy stinks! Anyway, when we catch up, it's finally time for another battle. After a turn one protect from Waffle and a missed T-Wave, all I can do now is click Apple Acid to drop special defense. We thankfully dodge a play rough, and after being paralyzed, I put my plan into action. Play rough actually goes into more Pico as we set up Leech Seed, and we get the Pheasant to minus two Spadef before going down. Since the bird is still outspeeding us, I go to Pancake and use the new signature move Zero Bomb, which lowers speed for three turns as long as Diplin stays on the field. Carmine Sinistra even gets another drop with Shadow Ball. We go down to Dazzling Gleam next turn, but now it's time for our ultimate weapon, Double Matcha. Mochi's ability, Hospitality, heals about 50 HP to an ally when it hits the field. Then a Shadow Ball from Carmine's and a Hex from Mochi bring Pheasantipity just low enough to drop to Leech Seed Sap. With the Hearth Flame Mask back in Ogre Pond's hands, all that's left is the bruiser of the group, Okie Doggy. Carmine's more Pico starts things off with Thunder Wave again, but even after a Dragon Dance, French T's acrobatics doesn't do much to the Toxic Hound. Sinister's Shadow Ball and Mochi's Hex can really shred this thing, so after a few turns and some paralysis luck, we've taken Okie Doggy down and reclaimed the Cornerstone Mask. Kieran then tells us to bring Ogre Pond to the village. Even though we're sure they all fear our little friend, we decide to trust him and head off. Turns out he told the villagers the true story of Ogre Pond and the Loyal Three, resulting in them apologizing to the Pokemon for treating it like an outcast. As we bring the Legendary back to its home, it decides it wants to travel with us instead of staying in Kitakami. Kirin, the deluded child that he is, decides that he wants to take the Ogre for himself and challenges us to a battle for custody. Oh no, he has that Naruto cat eye going on. This could be the end for us. Kieran's team heavily counters grass types, and with my squad consisting of four of them, an Ursa Ring, and a useless Sinistee, I get absolutely clapped. Multiple times. But eventually, things turn out like this. I start by protecting with Flapple to block Shiftry's fake out. Next turn, a Dark Pulse brings us below half health, procking our gluttony, allowing us to eat our Citrus Berry early. Now we use Pounce to lower the cursed tree's speed, then U turn for the kill and bring Sinistra in to bait out Yan Mega. Crumpet is unfortunately just being used as a sack to Air Slash in order to get Toast on the field for free. His Assault Vest means he can tank two hits from the Dragonfly before going down, but we do need to connect an 80% accurate Rock Slide on this turn. Even with a Keyberry boosting Yan Mega's defense, we avoid a Crit Bug Buzz and finish the Menace off with Ice Punch, bringing out Polyrath. Since Ursa Ring is in range of dying to close combat, Kieran should use the Fighting type move instead of Belly Drum, giving us a free swap to our Grass Ghost Mochi. We're outsped, so Ice Punch does solid damage, but a single Leaf Storm in retaliation can one shot the Amphibian. Diplin is next, so I go back to Flapple, who easily tanks Syrup Bomb. At minus one speed, we're slower than the Candy Apple, so Dragon Pulse on the following turn takes French T down. The much bulkier Appleton can now hit the field, and although Dragon Pulse does big damage, Ripen means we get a lot of HP back from our Citrus Berry. We win the War of Draconic Blasts, surviving a second from Diplin on 9 HP and getting the kill. Kieran sends Gliscor out now, and all I can do is let Waffle drop to an X Scissor. This does, however, allow Pancake to come in for free, tank a dual wing beat, and coat the Flying Scorpion in Syrup to start dropping its speed. We protect on the next turn to bring Gliscor to minus two, and I get lucky, landing a double protect, so now we actually are faster. Energy Ball does good damage before we go down, but the door is wide open for Sinistra to finish the Gen 4 evolution with Leaf Storm. Kiki's final mon is a Probopass, and even at minus two special attack, our flurry of leaves still does about 20%. We managed to bring the mustachioed rock down to around 60% before going down, leaving things all in Toast's very capable hands. Or claws. Either way, Ursa Ring outspeeds for a close combat, finishing the rock steel type, and crushing Kieran's dreams. To my surprise, before catching Ogre Pond, you need to beat it in four consecutive battles without healing, each time donning one of its masks. Naturally, the first battle against the Hearth Flame Mask, which makes Ogre Pond a Grass Fire type, won't be a walk in the park for me. Its Embody Aspect ability also raises a stat dependent on which mask the Ogre is wearing. 
Since she terrored, I also allow myself to, making Pancake resistant to fire by dropping its grass typing. Ogre Pond sets up grassy terrain turn one as we land a Syrup Bomb. With my Protect strategy, the Legendary is now at minus two speed, but is still faster than our Apple and can unleash its signature move, Ivy Cudgel, a base 100 power attack with a high crit chance that changes type based on its mask. Dragon Pulse does very solid damage back, and now at minus three, we're faster. Thanks to a held Bright Powder, we actually dodge the Ogre's next two Ivy Cudgels, bringing it down to just a few hit points. I guess this was actually a speed tie, since on the turn I'm expecting a knockout we're clobbered by the weapon, but with 73 HP remaining, the toughest mask is down. Next up is the Wellspring Mask, raising Ogre Pond's special defense and making it a water type once terrored. Our speed drops from before have gone away, but after tanking the water type cudgel on 6 HP, we connect a critical hit super effective syrup bomb for massive damage. Again, I protect on turn 2, then somehow get another Bright Powder dodge, meaning Pancake can fire off an Energy Ball to bring form number 2 into the red. We unfortunately go down on the following turn, but Diplin put in phenomenal work as I now bring in Waffle. Instead of doing damage, Ogre Pond resets Grassy Terrain, giving us a free knockout with Energy Ball. The Ogre now puts on the Cornerstone Mask, making it a Rock-type. Ivy Cudgel brings us into the red, but Apple Acid does over 50% and gets a special defense drop. Appleton goes down on the next turn, but Mochi can come in, tank the Rock-type attack, and finish Mask 3 with Leaf Storm. Finally donning the Teal Mask, the Grass-type gets a speed boost and prepares for its last-ditch effort. Sinistra unfortunately is KO'd by the weapon coated in Ivy, but Flapple actually dodges Slam and starts lowering speed with Pounce. The second connects, but only does around 70 damage, so we're still in pretty good shape. We dodge slam number 3, and now at minus 2 speed, we're faster than Ogre Pond. Its last two turns are spent resetting grassy terrain and missing one final slam as French T was able to solo the Teal Mask Wearer with pounces. We can now add the Legendary to our team, replacing the Sinistee I was never able to evolve. I decide that now would be a good time to work on Perrin's quest. If you haven't already, subscribe for the excruciating hours spent catching the 150 Kitakami Pokemon needed to move to the next step. I did manage to find this shiny Sandshrew who was just chilling in the Baron Paradise, so maybe it was all worth it. Anyway, the photographer decides to test our strength in a battle against her Noctowl and Leafeon. After taking them down, she's convinced that we have what it takes to go up against the Blood Moon Beast, an Ursaluna that apparently traveled here long ago from Isui and developed a red mark on its head. Perrin has been trying to find and photograph the beast, so in order to help her, we need to do some surveying of the Timeless Woods. We set up this absolutely adorable shaman tent, then once night falls, we get to play a little Pokemon Snap. Once we photograph 10 different Pokemon species, Perrin is able to triangulate the location of the Blood Moon Beast. We hear some stomping in the distance, and jeez, this thing is huge. Somehow, this professional photographer forgets to turn the auto flash off her camera, so now we're dealing with an angry monster. Ursa Luna calm minds as I go for the tried and true Syrup Bomb into Protect Strat. At minus 2 speed, we're faster, but Energy Ball doesn't do much, and this bear continues to raise its special stats. Thankfully, our second Grassy Sphere gets a Spadef drop, but then Pancake gets absolutely obliterated by the new move, Blood Moon. I bring Ogre Pond in, wearing her Teal Mask, but even a Terra Ivy Cudgel doesn't do much to the beast. It powers up to plus 3 special attack, and after one more slam from Sour Patch, she also drops to the Blood Red Beam. I bring Toast in, who might be able to reason with its distant relative, close combating for half its remaining HP. One more leaves Ursa Luna on literally one, so after taking Ursa Ring down, Flapple gets the finish with Acrobatics. We then get a guaranteed catch, adding Gumdrop to the party over its Jotonian cousin. Hold on, Perrin. If you didn't think I could actually beat this thing, did you just bring me out here to die? And after all that, she didn't even get a single good photo of the thing. At least she hands us a Choice Scarf and a Hisuian Growlithe for our trouble, with some foreshadowing that the pair may return in Part 2 of this DLC. Now let's turn our attention to Carmine, who wants to have one last battle against us at Loyalty Plaza. She leads Mightyana, whose Intimidate will be useless against Gumdrop. 
We calm mind as the dark type howls, but on the following turn, Carmine gets greedy, boosting her attack again, then goes down to a moonblast. Next is Levani, who swords dances instead of hitting us with a grass type move, so mod number 2 goes down to a blood moon. More Pico has the right idea, doing some seed bomb chip as our earth power brings it down to its focus sash. It does also manage to aura wheel us before going down, and since we're below half health, I decide to let Ogre Pond join the fun against Sinistra, resisting Macha Gacha four times thanks to the Hearth Flame Mask. This move is essentially better Giga Drain, having a little more base power and a chance to burn. An Akaberry saves the ghost from a one hit KO from Ivy Cudgel, so after taking a hex, Sour Patch finally clears the field. Last up is Ninetales, who's hit for almost half its health by our fiery club, but Disable means Ogre Pond is essentially useless against this thing. I bring Diplin in, who can survive two flamethrowers, but Dragon Pulse just isn't enough to take the W, so our candied apple gets cooked. I think it's only fitting that Ogre Pond gets the finishing blow, as one more Ivy Cudgel leaves Carmine sheeshing. Wait, Carmine is embarrassed to say something to us? No, Briar, you ruined the moment! Anyway, we regroup as all the pairs have completed the orienteering assignment. Briar tells us that herself, along with Carmine and Kieran, will be heading back to Blueberry Academy earlier than anticipated as there's been some development with the Great Crater. Yeah, she wants me. As the school trip concludes, we get a glimpse of Kieran in his room having a classic Sasuke moment. No way he's gonna be evil in part two. Right? Well, there's only one thing left to do in order to wrap our time in Kitakami up. Catch the legendary trio, the Loyal Three. Each member is waiting where we battled them in Titan form, so after nabbing Okie Doggy, Monkey Dory, and Pheasant Dippity, we can finally consider this journey over. Good riddance, chicken boy.